Well, I certainly, I certainly hope you enjoyed that first segment on campaign finance. And again, if you'll join us for our next show, we're going to drill down and try and find some solution sets to this uh, problem area. I think you now understand that campaign finance, although it's a sound bite for maybe everything we don't like in politics, it's a very complicated topic. It's, it's multifaceted, multilayered. And if you don't really understand some of the nuances and the, comp and the complexities of it all, I don't think we'll get to the point where we can understand and work together on the solutions. One of the subsets of campaign finance that came out in today's conversation is the notion of incumbency protection. The notion that our elected officials that are making the laws in campaign finance, uh, although they make it sound as though they're doing these great and wonderful things and fixing the problem. In most cases, they're not fixing the problem. And in most cases, they are doing things that are going to protect their ability to stay in office. They're going to protect their ability to outraise their opponents. There, there are advantages that are going to be built into the system that in most cases are going to cause them to not even have opponents. So we have this whole construct, this whole topic of incumbency protection. I want to spend a few minutes talking about a few related topics today of how our elective officials, quite frankly, game the system. They are the ones that are passing the laws that are setting up the campaign finance, and they're doing it in a way that's helping to protect their positions. They do this in a, in, a, in a number of other areas as well. So the first topic that we obviously covered today is the campaign finance. Another topic that we're going to cover in some subsequent shows is redistricting. Now redistricting is required by the Constitution. Every 10 years there's a census, and every 10 years the population of the country shifts, and every 10 years the districts that our representative run, representatives run in also change. Obviously, uh, statewide elections don't change, but we're talking about is our congressional districts, our state representative districts, our state senator districts. They're being redrawn every 10 years. Now, similar to campaign finance, the laws that are being passed to set up the new districts are being passed by the incumbents. So if you were an incumbent, what would you do? Would you draw a district that protected your seat, that made sure that the number of people that you th knew were going to vote for you were in your new district? Or would you want to stray from that and perhaps get to a little more neutral representation and create competition? Well, again, it's not in your self-interest to create competition. It's in your self-interest to keep your job. So you'll find that many of our elected officials are drawing maps, are doing the redistricting in a way that's, again, incumbency protection protecting their jobs, limiting competition, limiting the number of people that would run against them. So they've limited the amount of money the opposition is going to raise in a redistricting. They're limiting, quite frankly, who, whether or not someone will even run against them, depending upon the makeup of the district. Another tier of this incumbency protection relates to voter registration. Now, in another uh, segment, we talked about the fact that the voter registration numbers in our country are very low, very low. Uh, in fact, um, one of the lowest voter registration totals in the world. Other countries' voter registration numbers and voting numbers are much higher than ours. So how does this happen? Well, first of all, there's a lot of people who have checked out of the system, but there's a good number of people who just find the system too difficult, too cumbersome. Uh, and this is part of what I would suggest is a systematic approach to, again, protect the incumbents and help them get reelected. If you're a Democrat, you want to have a system that's going to get the most Democrats registered. If you're a Republican, you want a system that's going to get the most Republicans registered. Or maybe if you're a Democrat and Republican working together, you want to have a system that's going to get the most people that are party members registered. You don't want the independents, though. You don't want the outliers. You don't want the people on the margin. You don't know how they're going to vote. So you make it a little more difficult to be registered. And you maybe do it in a way that's subtle, so you target populations that you know, if they did register, might want to vote for you. We're going to spend some time on some other shows, other programs, drilling down on this topic. So I'm not going to go into great, deal, great detail t today. But again, I want to suggest that the people who are making the laws are making the laws in campaign finance, in redistricting, and in voter registration that, again, is going to protect their incumbency. One more topic, which, we, we talked, which we're going to see in the next segment of today's show, is called ballot access. Now, this determines how hard it is to actually get on the ballot. What are the requirements to get on the ballot? And we're going to spend some time talking about ballot access throughout subsequent programs. But we, you'll see in our next segment, sex, 
in our next segment, we have one of the nation's leading experts in ballot access who's going to be a regular contributor to this program. So this is the notion of incumbency protection. These are the people that are making the laws, and in making the laws, they're protecting their ability to get reelected. Uh, again, I think it's a self-preservation issue, but we as the voters, we as the ones who don't like the dysfunction, we are the ones that don't like the polarization, we've got to come to grips with these topics, and we've got to work on solution sets to move forward and to have less dysfunction and less polarization.